Welcome to Season 2 of the Making Bank Podcast, where we continue our exploration of South Florida's entrepreneurial landscape with host Keith Costello, co-founder and CEO of Locality Bank. Sit back, relax, and let South Florida visionaries guide you on an entrepreneurial journey from tribulation to triumph, sharing the very stories that have shaped them. Rob Saravalo, welcome to Locality Bank's Making Bank Podcast. Thank you, Keith. Happy to be here. Yeah, so it was great how I just rattled your name off like yeah, it that. Amazing. It's not an easy name no, to pronounce. No, I think it's on the I, first try. That's yeah. impressive. <laughs> <laughs> you guys don't know, that was like on the eighth take that I got Rob's name finally. So well, we're really excited about having you on. Um, you know, first, I have to start off by just saying thank you for your service in the military. It's really uh, impressive uh, military career that you had before becoming an entrepreneur. So thank you for that. Well, thanks. It was uh, it's a great career. Honestly, I would do it again in a heartbeat. Um, I feel like I was very blessed to have those experiences. So yeah. So that. so Rob is the real Top Gun. You know, Tom Cruise. <laughs> he's a movie star. This this guy is the real deal. He is a real Top Gun. So we're going to start where we usually do when we're talking with. Mm -hmm our guests uh, uh, about their entrepreneurial successes. And we're gonna start, you know, growing up and in, in your family and tell us a little about your family life, where you where you grew up and yeah, what so it was like. I was actually born and raised here, Fort Lauderdale, which is okay. rare, right? Yeah. So moved away, you know, obviously for college and for the Navy and I actually moved back in 2013, but my parents um, were Italian descent. So my mom was born in New Jersey uh, moved to Italy, spent a lot of her youth there where she actually met my dad. And my dad was from a small town in Calabria in Southern Italy. And, you know, he was uh, a teenager during World War II. Mm -hmm. So, you know, his town was overrun by the fascists and the Nazis. I mean, he used to hand salami through the fence to the POWs. I mean, mm -hmm. he had all these stories when he was growing up. Yeah. And one of his um, memories that he held dear was the American military liberating his town. Right. I mean, you see the movies, the old World War II movies and the Jeeps roll into the town and everyone's cheering. And and he had this memory because his town was up on top of a mountain and the American bombers flying really low overhead. So he said, look, when I get old enough, I'm going to go to go to America, become a citizen, land of the free, you know, just like all the old immigrants back then. So I was brought up in this household, very patriotic, as you could imagine. Mm -hmm. um, I watched a lot of old military movies like Patton and you know Bridges of Toko Ri and all those movies that nobody knows about anymore. Yeah. So I kind of grew movies. up with this, this <laughs> idea, right? That America is a great place to live. And I still believe that to this day, um, even with all of its faults, right? And, and my dad used to say that too, and my mom as well. My mom, uh, again, born uh, in New Jersey, lived a part of her life in Italy. And she was a very, very intelligent woman actually graduated college in her 60s because she should have, you know, should have graduated, you know, early on in her life. And she had got married at, you know, at 18, like all the young Italian girls did back then and, and but wrote several books and kind of wow. brought me up to be very adventurous. You know, um, I read a lot when I was a little kid, you know, so the two of them together are kind of, if you think about molded the way I am today, which is, you know, love this country, find adventure in life you know, do things outside of the norm, which was funny because they were both very conservative in terms of safety and risk. So my dad was big and, you know, telling me stories about growing up in Southern Italy and getting chased by wolves when he was hunting, <laughs> but I couldn't ride my bike off the block, you know? <laughs> it was just the way it was, right? <laughs> but I was very fortunate, I think, um, to grow up in that household because I think, you know, they, they, uh, they instilled the right values early yeah. on from a brother and I. That's great. Yeah. And so as you grew up, uh, you went away to college, I guess you went. Yeah, I went to the University of Florida. All right. Go Gators. Go Gators. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so what'd you study there? So I was, uh, it's funny, I started off in engineering because I had this desire to be an astronaut someday, you know, and I got there and, and I'll be honest with you, I think I had a little bit too much fun. And I said, you know, engineering's not for me. Yeah. Um, I ended up actually switching to business. So I ended up with a degree in business. Okay. And um, after college, I came back here for about a year and a half. I always wanted to be a Navy pilot, by the way. So Top Gun, if you've heard of this movie, it's kind of small little uh, indie film, right? Came back <laughs> yeah, on, right? in 1986, <laughs> um, you know, it came out, I was 11 years old, right? And at the time I wanted to be an Air Force pilot because I watched the old uh, Chuck Yeager movie, you know, Right Stuff and everything else. Yeah. And I see Tom Cruise ride a motorcycle, date his instructor and land on a ship. And I'm like, wow, you could do that? That's awesome, <laughs> you know? So I decided I'm gonna be a Navy pilot. So. 
um, I had this singular focus. Um, after college, you know, I came back here actually for a year and a half. We had some things going on in the family and it was the right time. And then I joined the Navy. I went through um, officer candidate school in Pensacola, Florida. Okay. And that was the start of a, just an amazing first part of my life. And what year was that that you went into the military? That was uh, 2001. 2001. So I was actually sworn in almost a month to the day before September 11th. So, wow. yeah, I get sworn in at the recruiter's office a, a month later, the towers fall. And I'm like, you know what? I'm in the right place. Wow. I'm in the right place. That's yeah. incredible. And then, so you went through the, the Top Gun school and the training. Yeah. And- so flight school is about two years long. So yep. officer candidate school is roughly 13 weeks. If you've ever seen the old Richard Gere movie, Officer and a Gentleman, right. you, know, you have the drill instructor and yeah. yelling at you with a smoky bear hat. Right. You know, these guys are hilarious. <laughs> By the way, you couldn't pronounce my name. Nobody can, right? So the <laughs> drill instructor did the same thing you did. You know, he mispronounced my name. And he's like, is that right? Officer Kenneth Saravolo. And I said, no, sir, it's Saravolo. He goes, no. He goes, that's wrong. He goes, it's Cavallo, you know? <laughs> he goes, your family's been pronouncing it wrong the entire time. So mm-hmm. it was just, it was a fun experience, really challenging. But they, you know, the, the lessons that you get early on in the military are tremendous. Yeah. You know, yeah. we were talking about earlier, I think before the cameras came on, we were talking about um, attention to detail, right? So in officer candidate school, you get inspected, your lockers get inspected and you have to fold your underwear, you know, six inches by six inches. Yeah. And you go stay up all night long doing this, all right? <laughs> so you've got a ruler out and you're, you know, using spray and irons and tape and you're trying to keep everything like perfect because, you know, the cloth will start to expand with humidity and everything else. So you're trying to plan for that. And when they come with the ruler and if it's literally a hair over six inches, they tear the entire room apart, your locker, all your friends' lockers, everything else. And it sounds like it's, you know, oh, that's harassment or that's hazing, but it's not. So you think about that, how does that apply to combat, right? If I get one little digit wrong on a lat long when I'm dropping a bomb, I could kill innocent people. So mm-hmm. attention to detail. Mm-hmm. Now apply that to business later on in life, right? Looking at a PL. And one little miss, you know, you could run a company out of business. So the lessons early on, I think in officer candidate school really set the stage for development for the rest of your career. And it's tremendous, t- t- in my opinion, it's tremendous training that people don't really realize as you're going through it. Yeah, I actually spent time in the army. I was, in, okay. I was an army officer, so right. I went through ROTC. So you know. And same thing, yeah. yeah. I mean, I I really relish my time in the military. Yeah. And I, Absolutely. I was, unlike you, I didn't have this desire to be in the military. I needed money to go to college. <laughs> so I ended up in it. But I was like, after I got in, I'm like, this is awesome. You know, and the, and the lessons I learned, I feel the same way. So, right. so you end up um, in the military, you end up actually serving and going overseas. And tell us about your, your uh, military experience. Yeah, so um, graduated flight school uh, in 2003. Um, my dad actually passed away. Um, Sorry. In, thank you, in May of 2003. So I was rolled back a class. I was supposed to go to the ship and do my first landing and he passed away. But it was a tough time as you can imagine because he was one of the reasons I joined the Navy. Right. You know, um, And I remember getting back to uh, flight training and my operations officer was like, hey, you know, I, was, I was, came home for a week to Fort Lauderdale, you know, buried my dad, had a lot of Jack Daniels, flew back, mm-hmm. you know, five, six days later. And he said, what do you want to do? I said, sir, put me in an effing jet. That's where I belong. And I ended up graduating number one in my class wow. uh, in flight school. And so I, I was able to select um, F-14s because that's what, you know, they flew in Top Gun. I'm like, I got to fly that <laughs> before they retire it, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I flew the F-14. Um, I deployed I uh, did a West Coast deployment, a brief one um, in the Pacific, and then I did the East Coast deployment, which was the Iraq deployment. So I spent seven months on a carrier on the wow. Roosevelt doing Iraq missions and yeah. um, came back. After that, we transitioned to the Super Hornet. So that's the jet in the new Top Gun. So I got to fly that one yeah. uh, for about a year, year and a half, which is amazing. Cool. Um, and then I transitioned to the F-5 to be an adversary, so a sparring partner. So we play the bad guy. Mm-hmm. And the F-5 is actually the MiG in the first Top Gun. So I like to say I flew three jets and two <laughs> Top Guns, right? So, yeah, um, and awesome. that was a really cool experience. And I did that. Um, so all in all, it was active duty for about 11 years or 10 years. And then I stayed on as a reservist for about another four flying okay. after I started the business. So I noticed you started the business in 2009? So I founded it in 2009. Okay, Uh, but you were still in the military. Still in the military. Yeah, Yeah. so explain. Well, how did you, 
how did you end up starting the business? I guess yeah. That's probably where so I should, what most I guys and girls get out of the military flying and they go to work for Delta, right? You know, or whatever. And nothing wrong with that. It's a great job. Yeah. It's, you know, you work 10, 12 days a month. You make very good money. Um, but a lot of us, we look at that. I call it the airline lobotomy. I'm like, wow, you have all this training, all this experience, you know, and you take it and you stick it on a shelf and you ride a bus, right? You fly a bus. Mm. And so a lot of guys and girls is like you did, you know, they get out of the military and they start businesses and they become very successful. I said, well, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna, you know, take a swing at starting a company. And I always wanted to do it. I was gonna wait until I retired. So I was gonna start in like my fifties and I'm 48 now, by the way. Okay. Um, and in 2009, actually I was with a buddy of mine, a couple of buddies and we were in Europe and I spent about a week riding a motorcycle in Southern Italy, visited my dad's hometown, you know, on, mm. on the back of, on, on a motorcycle. And I was reading, screw it, let's do it by Richard Branson. So I get done with the book and of course I'm like, ah, screw it, I'm just gonna start now. So I started the business while I was still in the Navy and it was in my garage, you know, stationed in Key West at the time. Wow. And yeah, yeah, so there's a little <laughs> bit of an overlap there. Obviously it was challenging mm -hmm. and um, my last year, in the Navy, I thought I was gonna have to go to Afghanistan for a year. So my first employee who became a business partner of mine, Nick Feltry, you know, he he came, he was my seaplane instructor, by the way. And uh, he came on board, moved to Key West before we could even, you know, generate revenue. It took me a year and a half, government delays, right? They told me in 90 days, it took me a year and a half to get licensed. So we didn't have any revenue for, you know, a year and a half. So I yep. took this um, gig, which I thought was gonna be in Afghanistan. So I'm like, hey, here's all the bank account numbers. Here's what you need to know. Here's how you communicate with the FAA. Just take care of it. And about two months later, they're like, hey, you're not going to Afghanistan anymore. You're going to Tampa. <laughs> Tampa stand, right? We call it. So I went to St. Comet. Tampa, I worked for General Mattis, actually. Yeah. So, so I ended up, thank God, staying in Florida. And that helped us actually get the business off the ground. Great. Yeah. And then I got out of active duty, became a reservist to try to get the business going. So you kind of bootstrapped the business. You started it with, with your own money and, and yeah, while yeah. you were still I, in the military. Uh, yeah. You know, again, if I could go back, I, I've learned a lot of lessons. Um, you know, I sold my house. I had a house in Virginia Beach. I had a beautiful, I don't know if you're a car guy, but a 911 Turbo, a 993, oh God, blast yeah. the air cool. cool. <laughs> sold that, you know, uh, sold the motorcycle, the boat in the backyard. At one point I was selling a kayak to try to find parts for an airplane. I mean, this was early on and yeah. Um, yeah, and we bought this 1976 little four seat seaplane, you know? Yeah. And that's how we started the business. I was um, making reserve pay for probably 30 grand a year uh, and supporting, you know, myself, my fiance at the time. She was she was in the Tajik military and she got out. And um, so it was the two of us in a small apartment here in Fort Lauderdale and then Nick and his wife as well with no income. So it was a really challenging wow. time. And funny story, we had a, company credit card and we were putting gas in the airplane and you know they banks no offense banks wouldn't talk to me back then it was tail end of a recession and it's an airline right, it's like right. the risky 2009 right yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> yeah so we prayed a lot you know what i mean mm -hmm. um so it's funny we we did a flight a free flight for the archbishop of miami mm -hmm. and we flew him to bimini you know and i told nick he was flying and i was back here and i was like listen make sure the archbishop prays for us. Like, just like, you know, I mean, and I'm, you know I'm, I'm, I'm not that religious, but I'm yeah. religious enough. Yeah, I believe in God, you know? And um, funny enough, our, we had a $6,000 limit on a city card and we couldn't, I couldn't afford fuel for the next day. I kid you, true story, that night, um, they bumped my limit to 25,000 and we were able to do the next day's flight. Wow. It's amazing, yeah, so, you know. Thank you, Archbishop. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Archbishop, <laughs> seriously. Um, so it was a really challenging time, I think yeah. the first few years, but, um, we just kept our head down, you know? And when when did you start to, so so did you start off, you had to, is that the first thing you had to do is buy your first plane? Yeah, and, and, yeah so. And getting that money to do that and. The and, way the FA works, like yeah. you can't start an airline. They won't, so you can you get all the paperwork done, but they won't do the work because they're really busy unless right. they know you're serious. And the only way they know you're serious is if you have a lease, a signed lease for an aircraft or you own an airplane. Okay. I had neither. I couldn't get a lease signed because I didn't have any income. Right. So, so I had to buy an airplane just to get them to take me seriously. Wow. And it took me. And how much did that cost that first plane? So remember? it was funny. It was um, I think we spent like 150 grand on it, and uh, I was so fortunate because again, no banks would talk to me. Yeah. Um, I met a gentleman. Actually, had a wedding in 2009. Uh, owns a bank. Owns a bank up in Ohio. Mm -hmm. And he's really big in aviation and we kind of hit it off. And I was telling him, this was before I started the company. I was telling him what I thought, you know, my ideas were. And he reached out, he said, look, I think it's a great idea. So when it came time to buy the airplane, he actually helped me finance it. 
Wow. His bank. Through his bank in yeah. Ohio. And the second one too. So Wow. Yeah, it's great. So We're that's still- a great story because, you know, I mean, that's part of why we yeah. do these is because a lot of times it'll be like one of these small banks. Like mm-hmm. I'm sure it wasn't a huge yeah. bank, right? Yeah. The community bank in Ohio. Yeah. Because you had a personal relationship with this guy and he believed yeah. in what you're doing and he ended up financing. I think that's the key, right? Yeah. I mean, especially as a young entrepreneur or old entrepreneur, whatever, as an entrepreneur, yeah. I mean, building relationships and then creating a sense of loyalty to them also is important. Yeah. You know, my, um, my first, the first person I called when I decided to start a business was this guy who used to own a small seaplane business and he was also an insurance broker. And he spent an hour, I was, I was in my garage in Key West talking to this guy for an hour Tell me all of his lessons learned when he owned a small seaplane business, you know, it's been an hour with me. So when it came time to get insurance, I couldn't get insurance. He called the underwriter and he's like, this guy's like landing jets on the back of ships. Like just, you know, give him a shot. <laughs> to this day, we're now, you know, we fly 14 airplanes. I'm one of his largest clients and I get courted by all of the large insurance companies all over the world. He's my insurance guy. I am right. loyal to him because he gave me a shot when no one else would. Yeah. Same thing with uh, Jerry Holland, the owner of Shelter. Oh, right? wow. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we, I wanted to move the business here from Key West and couldn't afford it. Mm-hmm. I went to Jerry through a mutual friend and uh, I guess maybe he thought I was gonna ask for money or something or an investor. And I said, look, Jerry, I said, I wanna be at International. That's, that's to me, when I look at the growth of the business, I wanna have that connectivity to the Deltas, the Americans, and everything else. Um, and I said, I just can't afford to be there. So he called his um, head of leasing at the time, Iris, still close friends of mine as well. And um, they gave me a they gave me a, a deal, right? And I moved my little airplane up there. And I remember she asked me, she's like, how much fuel are you gonna buy this year? And I said, I don't know, maybe, maybe 3,000 gallons, you know? Yeah. We're like, today, you fast forward, you know, 10 years, where they're in the top three clients in terms of fuel purchases. Wow. So, so again, they gave me a shot and I'm extremely loyal because of that. So it sounds like you've had some good mentors and some people that really kind of yeah. helped you along the way everybody from the archbishop who kind of didn't know he yeah. was helping you but you know but these other people that you've mentioned and yep. anybody else stand out that that was there like as you were getting started that yeah I have, a whole, I have a whole list you know honestly yeah. um our first our first investor when we finally brought on you know more professional investors you know george Matz, and he again i met him at a at a, at a beach club you know, in a small um, resort that's super high end in the Bahamas. And mm-hmm. he was going to buy a house and he's like, man, it's really tough to get here. So I was like, oh, you got to meet this guy, Rob. He has a seaplane, you know, and again, we were only operating the second plane at the time. Yeah. And uh, we took him for a ride and, you know, he said, hey, look, why don't you come by my house and, and, you know, walk me through what your business plan is. And he was impressed and he brought on a couple of other guys and, you know, they came on board and they actually helped us grow the business. That was 2014. Wow. Um, you know, so YPO, it's an amazing organization. I joined YPO. When uh, did you join YPO? 2018. Yeah. Yeah. So we've had a few guests who've been yeah. YPO guys. And my forum, those guys are mentors. Yeah. You know, they're pretty far, much farther along than I am in terms of <clears throat> career because I had that military career. So I'm yeah. on my second career, you know? Yeah. And hearing their, you know, their struggles and what they went through and how they're successful. And I mean, they're guys, you know, that you could pick up the phone and call right now and ask a question. Hey, I'm walking into a negotiation. What do you think of this? And bounce ideas off each other. And it's just, it's a great group of people. Yeah. You know? And again, I think, you know, we all have mentors, you know, and we just don't realize it, I think. And there's something about, and you know, this, this, this toxic masculinity is the term now. Everyone wants to, you know, the, the, the guy that, you know, is the stoic man that's toxic. Well, there's some truth to that. And I'll say this because there's a stigma around, I think a lot of times men asking for help, right? And what I learned from the military, you know, think about the most toxic masculinity, right? With the way people look at it. They're like, <laughs> right. Oh, you're in the military. You must be a jackass. You know, you must be a jerk. You must have a big ego. The guys and girls that are in a squadron, you know, they're all competitive with each other, but they always ask each other for help. And it's mm-hmm. a tremendous organization. You experience that I'm sure in the army yeah. too, the, yeah. the support structure. So I tell a lot of young people who like, hey, I want to start a business. I'm like, have you found a mentor? Oh, I don't know. I'm like, just ask, ask yeah. me, like ask, right? right? By the way, go on YouTube, right? Watch, <laughs> the, watch this podcast. I yeah. mean, there's so much great information at our fingertips now that yeah. you could, to your point, the archbishop didn't know. Like you don't <laughs> know right now that you're mentoring some young people out there yeah. watching your podcast. Yeah. You know, it's, and it's this really cool world we live in right now in terms of the ability to be mentored. 
And, and right. really, and thank you for being on here today because yeah, that is what we're trying to do is, yeah. is help people out there who are looking for you know, new ideas or even motivation uh, yeah. from somebody who's done it and uh, been successful. So with, um, so you're 2014, you're, you're raising, you you found somebody who's investing yeah. in your company now. And then what's your, how do you get through that the next few years and how do you grow it to where you are today? Yeah, um, the seaplane business is tough, you know, especially in our region. It's looked at as the bush pilot, right? The Alaska bush pilot. Oh, this is cool. Or this is a, a rich man's toy. And what we tried to do was professionalize it. Mm -hmm. So even when we had that one little 206, that one little four seat airplane that was, you know, single engine, everything else, we tried to create a different model. So it's funny, if you fly on American first class or Spirit, different price points, you're gonna have different levels of service, same expectation of safety and professionalism from a, how the plane is operated and maintained, right? The charter world is different. So if you're saving $300 on a charter, odds are they're saving $300 of maintenance. I mean, it's it's that bad, especially in South Florida. South Florida mm -hmm. is notorious for fly-by-night crappy operators that I wouldn't put my family on, right? So we tried to look, the Navy knows how to do this really well. How do they do it? All right, so they you know, use great airplanes, great maintenance. Um, so we decided to buy newer airplanes and get really old, like 1970s airplanes. A lot of our competitors fly 50 year old airplanes. We fly all you know, 10 years or less. Mm -hmm. They train pilots from the ground up. So the Navy doesn't say, hey, does anybody know anybody who knows how to land on carriers, right? No, they find <laughs> people like young people, right? Yeah. And they're like, okay, this person's got a great attitude, great worth, work ethic. They have some skills. We're gonna train them up on professionalism, right? And, and checklist usage and, you know, risk management, right? And cockpit resource management. So we created a training program that's designed around the way the Navy trains. Mm -hmm. Two pilot crews in our airplanes. Our airplanes are single pilot airplanes. We got licensed by the FAA in 2013 to fly them two pilot crews, right? So we created this idea that we are more professional, right? We are Delta or American that lands in the water. That's, that's kind of how we built the business. And then we went to all of the, you know, resorts and said, look, you have a hard time getting people there. Right? Have you ever thought about seaplanes? Oh yeah, you know, I flew on one in Alaska. I'm like, let me guess, guy with a beard, you know, <laughs> shorts, he's got a can of oil in his back pocket. I'm like, that's cool in Alaska. Right. I go here, again, we're American, it lands in the water. And so the uh, resorts that we work with and uh, large, you know, homeowner groups started looking at us as the solution to their problem, mm -hmm. right? Great customer service. We have a luxury product. You show up at our private terminal at Shelter, we valet park your car. We give you drinks and coffee and talk to you. And, you know, again, so we just created, I think, a different model here in South Florida that didn't exist. That really helped us grow. Really that's, helped us. And that's awesome. Yeah, finding the right people that understand that and grasp that. Right? And so how many how many planes do you have now? So we have 14. Actually, just dropped to 13. Okay. Um, going back to 14 soon. So we have 14 aircraft. We operate um, out of Fort Lauderdale International, as you know. But we also helped launch a Bahamian airline, which is a whole other story. Um, wow. We operate up in uh, New York seasonally. So we have four airplanes operating out of the East River to the Hamptons with a company called Blade. Yeah, so I mean, and pre-COVID, we were actually in the BVI, Antigua, Puerto Rico, and Panama. So we grew quite a bit. And what we try to create was kind of a, be the, become the premier first and last mile provider. Yeah. And I could, you know, create the airline in a box and I could pick that up and I could stick it in any region, like an archipelago, or a place that's challenged with transportation like New York City or Boston, right? Sure. And launch an airline within six months. That's the model. That's wow. the model. Yeah. And then, so, you know, you've had great success. What is the plan for the future? You Again, thinking? you know, we, we look at first and last miles being our niche. We know how to do it really well. I think we're the best in the world at it. Um, so we helped launch this Bahamian airline, as you know. And mm -hmm. I think the Bahamas, when you think about it's 700 islands, across 700 miles, right? right? And they have 56 airports. And for years, the strategy of the Bahamas was, we need to build more runways. So you take an island, right? I don't know, two square miles, and you take half of it <laughs> and you build a runway, right? right? And yeah. by the way, while you're doing that, you're tearing up the mangroves, mm -hmm. you're destroying ecosystems, right? You're destroying the reefs, right? just to get air transportation there. So now you look, halfway around the world to the Maldives. The Maldives has 
1,200 islands and keys across 500 miles. In the 80s, they embraced amphibious seaplane service. And the Maldives is the number one luxury archipelago destination in the world. Yeah. And it should be the Bahamas, right? So, so we look at this first last mile model as a way to create true connectivity in places like the Bahamas, the Virgin Islands. Um, again, you know, you look at Boston to New York, things like that, anywhere that has a challenge with connectivity. And then fast forward 10 years, you're replacing these airplanes with EV tolls, right? With what? The electric vertical takeoff and landing. Wow. You know, because you need to create that, that route infrastructure, you know, get the market adaption, <clears throat> if you will, adaptation, sorry, of flying point to point, right? Versus mm -hmm. taking the, the three hour boat, taking the 20 minute, you know, seaplane ride. And then over time, as technology increases, I mean, we're looking at electrifying these airplanes that we have now, for example, but in the future, wow. You know, we're looking at that EV tall as as the solution to that yeah, last mile. Very cool. Yeah. So the um, I guess as you look back on your your journey from two thousand nine to, to to now, and then I guess how you know, and I'm thinking, what were the the moments when you kind of struggled? I'm wondering about COVID. Was that yeah. was that a tough time for you? A very tough time. I think. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, look, 2009 was a tough time. <laughs> uh, the government shut down in 2013 was a tough time because, um, look, we have, um, have you ever heard, you're an army, so you might yeah. know the, the OODA loop, right? Yeah. Do you know the OODA loop? So uh, they teach it, you know, I know they teach in the army, they teach in the Air Force, yeah. the Navy too, um, but it's a, a loop. It's a decision-making tool, right? Mm -hmm. And it's observe, orient, decide, and act, the four, the four steps, right? So remember Sully that lands in the Hudson, Yeah, right? Great story. So yeah. Sully hits a bunch of birds. And if you listen to the tapes or watch the movie, you know, he's not doing anything at first. You're like, do something, right? Like, like do something. And he's like, no, I'm going to observe and build situational awareness. So you build this level of situational awareness. That's the first O, right? So when COVID hit or when the government shut down, same thing. I remember being on calls, on board calls, on calls with other CEOs, and everyone's like, oh my, in March 13th, by the way, 2020, I'll never forget, it's a Friday, Friday 13th, when we realized this is real. And everybody is freaking out. Right. And we stayed calm. We said, okay, we're gonna create three levers that we're gonna pull over the next four weeks, right? So the next O is orient. Orient yourself to the reality. You know, no amount of, crying about it, praying about it, it's gonna change, right? I mean, that's it, it's happening. So the first O is observe, you build situational awareness. The second O is you orient yourself to the reality, right? The reality is it's here. Mm -hmm. Nothing we can do, we're not stopping it. There's nothing we can do. Call our congressman, it doesn't matter. I mean, yes, PPP, PSP came out later on, but initially no one knew that was gonna happen, right? right? So we said, okay, this is, this is the reality, so let's build some plans. So we built the three levers and then you make a decision. Right. The third, the third uh, part is the D, which is I think sometimes the hardest thing because people get <clears throat> decision paralysis. Right. Mm -hmm. What if it's the wrong decision? But it's okay because this is a loop. Right. So you see where I'm going with this. So we pulled lever one. So the A is the act. We decided, okay, we're going to pull lever one. We furloughed some staff. The first thing we did, executive team took a massive pay cuts. You know, that was the first week. Um, then you go through back to the first O. So it's a loop, it's the process is right. You're constantly going through, it's like when you play chess, right? You make a move, they make a move. Now your game plan has changed. So you have to adapt, right? So now we're orienting ourselves in the reality, build situational awareness, you know, uh, make some decisions, lever two, take the action, which sometimes, sometimes people get to the decision and then they can't actually pull the trigger. Right. Like, look, you've already done the hard part. You made a decision, just pull the damn trigger, right? Yeah. So you go through this loop. Is it working? Great. Keep going. If it's not working, go through the loop again. And by April 1st, so just over two weeks later, we built a 12 month timeline for recovery. By April 1st, where again, I was on the phone with people that were, oh my God, it's gonna last three, four years. I'm like, no, we'll be fine by June. Mm -hmm. You know, we're building this situational awareness. Now that plan <clears throat> by June changed 11 or 12 times, right? Right. <laughs> so we went through that loop process, but we were one of the first airlines to start flying again in June. You know, wow. we brought scheduled service back to Bimini. We, we had COVID testing in our facility on site 15 minute turnarounds with a partner mm -hmm. of ours and you know so we were able to recover pretty quick that's great which is great yeah and of course the psp and ppp you know were godsends because i was able yes. to bring people back to work right and employ them again right and yeah. keep them employed during this time and now you've probably seen that travel boom right i mean since yeah the yeah well <laughs> it's for an airline it's not easy right so yeah so you think about you can't just 
turn it back on. Yeah. You've got to get everybody retrained and everything else. So right. when the travel boom happened in 2021, um, we actually, this is one of the dark times in my life. Okay. I, so I've, I've made a lot of mistakes, right? As a business owner and CEO, I've done, I've, I've made every single one of the book, even all the ones that you read about, and even the ones that I know, you know, sometimes I make the same mistake <laughs> twice. And one of them sometimes is, I think as business owners and CEOs, right? Sometimes we want to take care of our people, but sometimes to the extent that you're impacting the business if they don't take care of you in return, right? Mm -hmm. So in the military, I got out of the military and I was like, you know, oh, wow, the civilian world is going to be just like it. You know, we're all, we're all competitive, but we're all in the same mission. You know, we have a mission, right? Which is deliver ordinance, take care of the girls and guys on the ground, right? As a fighter pilot, mm -hmm. you know, people always say, well, your job is to fly an airplane. I'm like, no. No, my job was to defend the ship, lead 300 people in my squadron, support guys and girls on the ground on, in combat, and then train others to do the same. The, the airplane's a tool, right? right? And flying the airplane was just part of my job description. That's it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, I wasn't a pilot. I was everything else, right? So I thought the civilian world's gonna be the same, but it's not, you know? Um, airline pilots are here to get the airline job. You know, not everybody, but say, you know, we have a great team now, but coming out of COVID, there was a lot of guys and girls that we kept employed during a pandemic that were sitting at home playing Netflix, you know, watching Netflix, playing right. video games <laughs> while we're like working 24 hours a day trying to keep their right. jobs. Right. So that the minute the airlines started hiring, because the airlines went a massive hiring boom, I lost like 30% of my staff. Yeah. Because again, there's no loyalty in yeah. the civilian world. Not, not saying no, we have, you know, right now we have a very loyal group of people. Um, all of the things that we've done to this point, we couldn't have done without the right people on board. Sure. So this, I'm, I'm using a, just a small subset here post yeah. COVID. So it became a challenge. So we actually did not have the supply to meet the massive demand where we could have made a crap load of money, right? Oh uh, yeah. So then 2022 um, happens and, and the revenge travel starts to, as you know, the economy starts to contract. Yep. Right. The people made a lot of money in crypto, lost a lot of money. Right. <laughs> people who made a lot of money in the market, lost a lot of money. Right. So now you're seeing this like divergence of a market. The resorts are full still, right? As we go into 2023. Yeah. But the ultra high net worth are chartering airplanes. And people like me are maybe flying commercial now. Maybe commercial first class, but they're not yeah. chartering airplanes, right? right? So you're starting to see this divergence. So the charter demand softened. So now we're adding more scheduled service. So we're, I feel like we're still recovering from the pandemic. And there was also a shift back to normal seasonality, right? Mm -hmm. Working remote was great because normally our planes fly, you know, Thursday, Friday, Sunday, right. Monday, and the rest of the days they're sitting burning cash. Well, guess what? We're flying Wednesdays a lot, right? It was great. Yeah. Now it's shifting back more towards normal travel patterns. Mm -hmm. And now we're having to manage the peaks and the troughs. A little, bit, a little bit different. Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're trying to figure all that out right now. That's awesome. Yeah. While yeah, trying well, to grow a business, you know? Yeah. So, well, it's, you've got a great story. And I, before we go to our, our final lightning round, let me just ask, <laughs> is there any other, anything I didn't touch on that you want to share with the audience about, about yeah. business and entrepreneurship and yeah, you know, um, history? How much time do I got? <laughs> Let's go. No, so yeah. it's funny. I, I one of the mistakes I made too, right? You start start a business and you're very excited about success. Mm -hmm. and you're very excited about what it means. You know, the first press release and getting the word out there, and the first big charter you do, and everything else. And we sometimes lose sight of the mundane tasks, the habits you have to build every day, right? And it took me a while. I think, especially coming out of COVID, like COVID was good, a good reset. I think for everybody, mm -hmm. people took advantage of it at least. To realize like, you know, this is all great, but you really have to embrace and learn to love the mundane stuff you have to do day in and day out to make it successful, right? So I climbed Mount Rainier a few years ago and I'll never forget, I mean, looking up at the, the peak and I, I had torn my meniscus like three months prior. Mm. So I'm, looking at, I'm like, oh my God, I'm never gonna make it. Yeah. I'm a Florida boy, you know, we're <laughs> at 12,000 feet already. And I'm like, this is impossible. <clears throat> I'll take another 20 steps, right? Then I'll take another 20 steps. An hour goes by, we stop and get a snack break. And like, lo and behold, you do that enough times, you hit the peak, right? Yeah. Um, landing on a carrier the first time. It's my God. I, it's okay. <laughs> the first time you're scared. I, I can't say it. I got to so crap yeah. this, right? <laughs> um, um, and the last time you're still scared. Like, you know, during the day it becomes fun, but at night it's super scary. So I remember like we were flying out to the ship and you're in a two seat training jet, but there's no instructor that's crazy enough to ever sit in the back of a, <laughs> you know, guy or girl's first yeah. carrier landing. So you're going by yourself to this like ship and you're like, oh wow, you know, aircraft carrier is huge. But you see it and you're like, 
oh man, that's pretty small. Like, <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna be able to do this, you know? Right, right. So I literally, this is a true story. I'm, I'm having this internal conversation with myself about, well, obviously I'm a good pilot, I'm well-trained. If I turn it around, do you think they'd let me join the Air Force? Cause they don't lose all the money they spend <laughs> on me, right? I just, I'm not gonna land on ships, this is stupid. Who does this, you know? I'm gonna wow. um, anyway, so I get closer, I'm like, okay. I'm actually talking to my dad. My dad passed away a few months prior, as you know. So I'm talking to him about this and you know, I'm like, okay, I, I gotta do this. Look, I'm just gonna get into the break. I know I could get into the break. That's, that's you know, a beam the ship, you know, 800 feet, 300 knots or whatever it was. I'll do, I know I could fly there out to near speed. So I get there, I'm like, okay, you know, okay, a mile up wind, just go a mile up wind, I go a mile up wind. All right, now come into the break. You know, it's four Gs, slow the, you know, uh, idle brakes, you know, speed brakes boards, slow the jet, slow the jet down. Okay, I got that, you know, now I'm at 600 feet, you know, drop the gear. And I just went through step by step by step. And then now I'm rolling out behind the ship. I'm like, okay, I, I can do this. I remember it's ball, ball is a little glide <laughs> slope, you know, ball line up, that's line up and angle attack, <clears throat> AOA. So I'm like, okay, ball line up, AOA. Ball line up, AOA. And I just went through that and boom, I land on the ship. You know, and it goes back to the idea that all of those, you know, hundreds of hours of training that led up to that moment where you're on a, you know, at a runway at two o'clock in the morning, because that's when you train sometimes when the runway is available, mm -hmm. just doing like one after another. And that's what you're not thinking about the ship. You're just thinking about your airspeed, your altitude, the ball line up AOA. Now, fast forward to business, right? Again, all the mundane stuff you and I do, the, the Zoom, the 20th Zoom call we have to have today, right? <laughs> that right. you're not looking forward to. I'd much right. rather be doing stuff like this mm -hmm. or launching a new business in another country, but all the mundane things is really what creates success. Waking up early, getting a cold plunge in, eating healthy, working out, right? Every day, building those habits. And if, so when I meet, when I talk to young people about this, I'm like, look, you're really excited about starting a business. That's cool. Are you excited about, you know, reading the book that you're gonna have to read tonight, you know, when all your friends are going out, right? I mean, that's what you have to get excited right. about. You don't have to love it, but you gotta learn to embrace it. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think that was, it's the biggest lesson you know, the Navy taught me, um, it's probably the thing that I sometimes lose sight of that always brings me back. And when I focus on that, there's always success on the back end of it. Wow, you know? well, that's great advice. And, yeah. you know, as, as people listen to that and you're talking about the mundane things, the everyday yeah. stuff, the habits, right? That you do every day, every day, over and over and over that yeah. finally, you know, people look at you and they're like, oh, wow, this guy's got it made. You know, he's yeah. got this company and, yeah, they don't realize everything that went on, right. you know, and all the struggles and the, you know, mm -hmm. the issues and the problems that you solved through the years. And, you know, it's the same with every guest we've had on, you know, they, they, um, you don't, you don't realize everything that somebody's going through to get to that yeah. point. So you don't, you don't. And it's a lot. <laughs> and it's, that's why it's sometimes lonely. Yeah. Right. That's yeah, why these yeah. types of conversations are great because you realize right. you're not the only person struggling. Yeah. Organizations like YPO or junior achievement, right? Where young people get to see, meet people like us who've gone through the, the yes. hell that it is to start and run a business, you know? Yeah. And see yeah. that we're all in it together, right? Absolutely. So, yeah. Well, thank you very much for sharing uh, your story and, and great advice for everybody. So we're gonna shift into lightning round, which is just quick answers. You know, we get a little little flavor about things you like <laughs> and, you know, we'll, we'll prod you along here a little bit. So a uh, favorite book? Uh, Marcus Aurelius Meditations. Oh, Hands down. good one. Wow. Hands down. I don't know if we've got that in our library. So we, we build a library off of the guest yeah. book re recommendations. So Stoicism is a phenomenal oh, philosophy. Oh yeah, I've got yeah. that daily Stoic. I read it. Yeah, same. I, I read it every, yeah. every morning. I send it to my kids every yeah. morning too. Uh, what's a song from your youth <laughs> that that is like your theme song? Um, so people would think probably the theme song from Top Gun, but honestly, it's uh, anything from the Rocky soundtrack. I was going to say Rocky. Yeah. I was going to guess so. That. My call sign was Rocco in the Navy. Oh, you know, like, okay, hey, Rocco. So yeah, that always gets me going. Oh, know? that's cool. Eye of the Tiger, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> Eye of the Tiger is great. Um, best piece of advice that you've ever received. Uh, so there's this guy, um, Guido, he was the commanding officer of VFC 13 in Valen, Nevada. And I was out there going through Tomcat training and they were filming a documentary. So they wanted to film me and him talking and he was giving me advice, mentorship. And he goes, listen, Rocco. And by the way, this guy's like famous pilot too. He's like, listen, Rocco, don't ever take a bad deal now for the promise of a good deal later. 
Wow. And I love that advice. Yeah. When you think about it, um, how it applies to business, like in negotiations, right? Or choosing where you're going to live, you know, in the Navy, it was, that was one of the things like, oh, if you go to go take these really crappy orders on the backside, there's gonna be really good orders, you know? Um, yeah. And the idea that, look, life is short, you know, and fight for what you believe in now, right? It's so, great. Yeah. How about your, your worst moment and your best moment in business? I think the worst moment for me, um, again, we went through a lot from 2009, you know, so, so many trials and tribulations. Um, the only time that I, I'm a very honest person, so I'll tell you that I fell in true depression was what I described to you in 2021 mm -hmm. when we were coming out of pen, the pandemic and I felt like, man, we're on the backside. I took care of my people. Like the people we furloughed, we, you know, I, every Friday I would have a town hall. Mm -hmm. Every Friday, 50, 60 people would call in. You know, I would give book recommendations. I'd talk about the industry, the business, the world, what we're reading, PPP coming out, when, we're, you know. So we spent a lot of time trying to take care of people through the pandemic. And that, the, that pilot exodus, when people are like, I remember sitting down with some of the guys and being like, hey, man, come on. We just, we survived the COVID together. Give me six more months. I can do what's right for me, Rob. Sorry. And it, it was that, that multiple mm -hmm. examples of that really hit me hard because I'm like, man, this is truly lonely. But then I remember that that was a small group of people, right? And what pulled me out of it were the people that I still have on board right. that were in it to win it. You know, where's the girl? It's funny, can I tell, I know it's a lightning round, but can I tell a funny story really quick? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> this woman, Tina, she's our VIP concierge, handles like the VIP flights and the owner flights and things like that. She's been with me for years. And, and what I'm about to say is somewhat illegal, but I'll say it anyways. Um, so she got furloughed and she kept dealing with customers. And I was like, Tina, I was like you can't, like by law, you cannot deal with customers. So like three or four weeks goes by and I'm talking to one of our major clients. He's like, yeah, I know, don't worry, Jane took care of me. I'm like, who's Jane? She had changed her, her email, <laughs> her signature block and she kept working for the company on furlough. Wow. You know, and, and stories like that. You know, we, we had um, a big, uh, so Hurricane hits the Bahamas, you know, prior military guys. We have a group of guys that we work with, um, all prior Navy SEALs and stuff. So we launched these big hurricane response efforts. And when Dorian hit the Northern Bahamas, um, we brought in Delta Airlines. We brought in the Blue Tide Marine guys, the former SEAL guys. We, we created a command center in my office. And in 10 days post Dorian, I don't remember Dorian just decimated the Northern Bahamas. Right. We evacuated 900 people and carried 250,000 pounds of aid. Wow. Right? Big, big. So my employees, the ones that worked 20 hours a day with smiles on their faces because they knew, you know, the Bahamas, the people in the Bahamas needed us and we're going to be there. Like those are the times, those are the, the examples that bring me out of that or brought me out of that. If that yeah. makes sense. So know? both, so both the best and the worst, which yeah. The, yeah. the same, the same yeah. situation. What's a fear that you've overcome? <laughs> so, um, besides landing on the, on well, the deck of an aircraft okay, carrier, I fly airplanes, I <laughs> jump out of airplanes, I got 40 something jumps. And, um, I told you I climb mountains. I actually have a big fear of heights. Nobody knows that. Wow. Like, I, I can't look over a balcony. Like, I can't look <laughs> over a balcony without feeling like vertigo. Wow. And it's hilarious, but I'll, I just, again, just kind of focus on what I'm doing. You know, mm -hmm. I jump out of airplanes and I'm like, this is, this is stupid. But I'm going to do it anyways. And I think getting over that fear has helped me, you know, get over other fears, whether it's business or, That's or huge. personal. Yeah. Do you have um, a favorite um, movie? Take a guess. I would say Top Gun. Top Gun. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I, yeah. I've got to tell you though, Top Gun <laughs> Maverick was better than the first. I love the new one. The new one you like better? Yeah. Really? Yeah, I was telling the guys a story earlier. It's funny. I got a friend of mine and yeah. you know, he's, he's got an 11 year old daughter. And, and I said, she just came, you know, she watched Maverick. And I was like, which one do you like better? She goes, well, the, the first one's a, this is 11 year old. First one's a classic, but the second one is better cinematically. I'm like, you nailed it. Like, that's, that's exactly <laughs> right. You know? That is funny. Yeah. Who is someone that you would like to have dinner with, living or dead? Oh, man. Um, you know, it's funny when I was younger, it would have been someone like Chuck Yeager, Alan Shepard, um, any of those people. But I go back to Marcus Aurelius, who was the emperor of Rome at a very challenging time. And if you read meditations, meditations, he didn't write it for public consumption. 
He wasn't putting out content, right? Mm -hmm. He was writing it for himself. It was his journal. And he's telling him, I'm this emperor of Rome, right? Telling himself like, hey, when it's time to get out of bed in the morning, you just gotta get out of bed. You're not designed by God to be living under the sheets and staying warm. Like this emperor of Rome, <laughs> 2000 right. years ago was going through the same stuff we go through. Yeah. And meditations was kind of an insight into how we thought and who. So I would love, if I had the moment, like just a time to sit down with that man. Wow. You know, that's a good learn one. more about it. That's yeah. going way back. Yeah. How about um, favorite restaurant? <laughs> uh, depends on the day. Um, I don't want to insult anybody around here. Uh, no, you, uh, <laughs> I think favorite Italian around here is Casa D'Angelo. Ah, oh, okay. Just, and I'm, it's just awesome. know, the but, Italian, I'm sure. But if you could, if you could, like, basically, <laughs> this is terrible. If you could send me anywhere in the world right now and say, okay, Rob, you could order whatever you want. I would go to California and I would get a double double animal style from uh, uh, In and Out Burgers. Oh, I, wow. I gotta tell, like, I, those are, <laughs> maybe because they're not here, but anytime we're in California, I got to find In and Out. You know, I went through Sears school, survival school. Right? Yeah. You don't eat for six days. And I remember like the, the, they pull you out of the POW camp after you got beat up a little bit and stuff. And the doctor's like, listen, you know, nobody, uh, nobody eat anything today, you know, cause your stomach's gonna be shrunk, you know, have a little bit of meals. We're like, yeah, yeah, doc, whatever. We went straight <laughs> to in and out and I had two double double, <laughs> you know, and I was fine by the way. Oh, that's so, great. Yeah. How about what do you do for hobbies? Uh, you, you exercise, obviously you look like you're in good yeah, shape. Yeah, uh, best thing I ever did for myself was build a home gym in my garage. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's no excuse for not working out, right? Day yeah. or night, I could get in there. Um, recently got a cold plunge about six months ago, which wow, is cool. really cool. Yeah. Um, um, so I live my life cold, but you know, for hobbies and stuff, I really love uh, motorcycles. Mm -hmm. So I take motorcycle trips. So um, two years ago, I went to Iceland and rode dirt bikes through Iceland, which is a dream trip. This summer, I'm going to Colorado with a friend of mine and we're riding the um, backcountry discovery route, you know, six, 700 miles all through the mountain passes on bikes. Oh, cool. I like that. And then um, I recently got into car racing a few years ago, which is very expensive sport. So it's not yeah. something I can really embrace right now. Yeah. But car racing for me reminds me a lot of flying in the Navy in terms of especially road racing. I don't mm -hmm. know if you watch any Formula One or yeah. you know, IMSA or anything, but it's the learning the, again, the monotony, right? Every lap has to look the same. Mm -hmm. If you're just trying to drive fast, you're gonna be slow. So you have to hit the same, like cornered four, right? You have to hit the apex at the right speed with the right brake pressure, you know, every time. So again, it trains this, this focus and monotony, yeah. right? And you, you're learning how to like just build this repetition and that's how you become faster and learning car balance and understanding that, you know, brake pressure, you know, yes, it slows the car down, but it also shifts balance to the front. So you can actually, you know, get a little oversteer and like all these little things. And then when you start adding other people in there, it's like a lot like dog fighting with jets or playing chess, cool. right? Because now you're planning two or three corners ahead. Right. It's just a really, really interesting sport that people just look at it and it's like, oh, cars driving around fast. And right. it's not that at all. Right. You know, I think that's why I love it. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So how can people get in touch with you? Yeah, so uh, our website's flytropic.com. Okay. Uh, there's another Tropic Air out there in Fort Lauderdale and a lot of people think they're us, they're not. Um, so we are Fly Tropic Ocean Airways, flytropic.com. Okay. Instagram is at flytropic. My personal Instagram is at flytropicrob. Keep it simple, <laughs> right? Right? Yeah, those are the ways. All right, well, yeah. great. Listen, you've been a great guest. We appreciate you coming on today. Oh, this, is, this is awesome. Thank, Thank you so you. much. I appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in to Localities Making Bank podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform to catch the latest episodes and visit localitybank.com today to learn more about all the benefits of banking local. Mm -hmm.